Wow, thank you so much. Um, thank you for that generous introduction. Excited to be here and spend be in the virtual space with you all. Um, as Fabia mentioned, my name is Michaela Ayers. I use she, her pronouns. I am a facilitator, I am a consultant, and I am a coach um, that helps my clients really develop an equity awareness around anti-racism. Um, so outside of my work life, I'm an artist and my practice looks like collage and it looks like ceramics. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and I'm gonna pass it to Brian. Good morning, afternoon, evening, y'all. Good to see some new faces and some familiar ones. Um, I'm a father, which is relevant because my kids might burst out on us in a moment and a uh, middle child. So my uh, inquiry into belonging began at a very young age. Uh, network weaver, curator, uh, curious person. I live in uh, rural Southern Oregon. So I also feel a connection to large trees as part of how I belong. Um, let me just ease into uh, our agenda for the day. And here come some children. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I think for me, the, the stakes around belonging feel existential. Um, John Powell, some of you may know at the uh, Institute Brethren in Belonging, is fond of saying that Maslow had it wrong, that actually belonging is our first um, and deepest need. And if you think about it, right, like babies don't survive in this world if they don't belong. So that feels right to me. Um, my life personally has been oriented around two questions. Not that I was fully conscious of these as a kid, but one is a deep interest in belonging. And unfortunately, I think for most of us, that inquiry comes from a place of not belonging and a question around alienation. And the second question for me is how transformation happens. And my own kind of professional path took me into anti-genocide work and international development. I worked at USAID and the Gates Foundation and I wanted to do good. I wanted to change systems, like I suspect many of us here. And I think the paradox for those of us who do systems change work is uh, we are, by definition, part of the system we're trying to change. And so if we want to change the system, we need to change ourselves. And I had a, a humbling experience. I was um, stationed in Myanmar in 2012 and 2013 when I first sort of landed the idea that I was complicit in the very system I was trying to transform. And that um, process of awakening kind of put me on this path towards what has become building belonging. And the question I wanted to sit with there was, <clears throat> if the world is fracturing around the question of belonging, um, which I think it is, right? Some folks are pursuing a very narrow exclusionary vision and others, I think, hoping uh, aspirationally for a more inclusive vision of belonging. Um, and the stakes do feel existential. And as these crises mount, I think there's a recognition by many of us that if we belong, we have a chance, right, to make it through to weather these storms, uh, literal and figurative. Um, and if we don't, we're in trouble. And so I think that kind of quest increasingly feels like what's happening in this moment. Uh, anyway, I promise there'll be some hope and lightness in this conversation as well, but um, mistakes do feel, you know, I think sometimes there's a, a risk in talking about belonging to have it feel we, you know, we all belong. Um, it can get corporatized pretty easily, so we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, just very briefly, our hope today is to um, not talk at you too much, but just kind of lay out some general concepts around uh, why belonging matters and how it um, shows up in our lives and work. So Michaela's going to kick us off. We do want to get you all talking to each other, and hopefully more than talking, actually sort of feeling into space. So we'll hopefully have space for a bit of a breakout. I'll talk a bit about systems transformation and how these concepts connect in our work and then give you all a chance to riff with each other around that. For folks who need to drop at the hour, hopefully not too many of you because it'll have a bit more spaciousness on the other end. Um, we'll have soft close. And then after the hour, we'll get into a little bit of Q&A as a plenary and invite people into practice. So great, we just talked together for 80 minutes. So what, uh, what might we actually bring back to our work? Beautiful. So now that we have an idea of how we're going to spend time together, let's talk about grounding. So I want to invite you into this moment um, and maybe, you know, the interactions that you had before the session or that thing that you have to do after the session, if we could just put those in a container and set that container over on the shelf 
um, for the next hour. And just breathe together. Take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. And just allow the body to fully arrive in this moment. And as you find the natural rhythm of your breath, I invite you to notice your physical presence. Like, where are your shoulders? Are they up by your ears? Like, is there a way that we can adjust ourselves to release any tension that the body is holding? With another deep breath, I want you to shift your attention to locate what emotions are present in your body with us right now. How are you arriving? For me, I feel excited because I love learning spaces <laughs> and a little anxious, of course, you know, new conversations. <sighs> so with another deep breath, I want you to just invite you to bring your intention internally and locate an intention for today's session. Maybe there's a need to acknowledge a desire, a challenge or curiosity that brought you here. And let that intention really inform your learning on today's call. So I wanna sincerely thank you for your presence and your attention over the next hour. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to learn and grow with you. And before we get into the nitty gritty, I would love to, the opportunity to play with you for just a moment um, because belonging is at its core, a very primal part of our human experience, right? We know it when we feel it and we recognize it in the places and in the people that draw this feeling and this sense of belonging out of us. So I wanna invite you to bring to your mind a person in your life that makes you feel like you belong. How do they make you feel? You know, maybe you're like me and you keep a picture of them near your desk. I, you know, I get to see them as I work. You know, as you locate that person, I want you to bring to your mind and locate that memory, perhaps a recent memory with this person and begin to just really breathe into how they make you feel. How do they support you? How do they make you feel like you belong to yourself and to the world? So now the fun part, I wanna invite you to pick up your device, whatever is near, near close to you, if it's your phone, if it's your email, and just let them know. Give them a little shout out, let them know why they matter to you in a way that honors the way that they make you feel. And I don't know about you, but I feel like the last two years of navigating the pandemic and isolation and reemergence it's taught me to never take for granted the people who feel like home to me. And so we can't be shy or bashful about letting our folks know that they matter to us. So thank you for the folks who I see already picking up their phones and sending those texts. Um, maybe this is an activity that you can return to after our time together. Um, but, and so thank you in advance for playing along. So, I'm here to talk to you about belonging, but before I dive into any session, I already want, I always want to know what do you already know? Um, so I would love to know what is your personal definition of belonging? Like how would you describe it to a child or with your first encounter from an alien from another planet? Um, I am a very curious person and belonging is one of those concepts that I find means different things to different people. Um, so I'm generally curious to know what, how you describe it. Um, I know there's so much wisdom in this room, so I would love to see your thoughts and ideas in terms of how you're describing belonging. Um, and as the chat, as you put in those ideas in the chat, I am going to offer you a definition and some concepts for us to build from. Um, but I already appreciate the things that I'm seeing, feeling like you are where you are supposed to be in the right place. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And I look forward to seeing some more of your ideas. Um, but we can see belonging in nature, right? When we witness a flock of birds congregating in a familiar feeding ground. 
According to Webster's Dictionary, belonging is this comfort, it's a connection, it's a fondness to people, places, or situations. And at that primal level, belonging is often created through sameness, which seems simple enough, right? But in my practice, I have found that belonging is actually <laughs> has many dimensions, right? So I wanna offer you a more complex definition. So at its root, belonging is that felt sense, right? We know it when we feel it. And it's supported by a few key ingredients. The first being inclusion which I could spend a whole day talking to you about. <laughs> but for today, I'm gonna to boil it down to this idea of repeated, genuine acceptance. And so into a social group. So we would be repeatedly socially accepted into our book club, whether we read the book or not, or we are repeatedly accepted into our ultimate Frisbee team, even if we miss that winning goal. So belonging is supported by the practice of inclusion. Inclusion is really important when we're thinking about belonging, but belonging also requires that we feel safe. And that's physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually safe. And safety is something that we co-create, right? Through our trusting relationships where respect is earned over time and where people are given the permission to self-actualize and influence their own outcomes. And last and certainly not least, belonging cannot survive without fairness. And in order to have this feeling of fairness emerge, um, equity is a really essential part of the equation. So now that we have a more nuanced understanding of what belonging could look like, um, let's talk about it in practice. And so we know belonging is inner work, right? It builds from the inside out. And so perhaps a question that you may have asked yourself is, how do I cultivate this sense or this feeling of belonging in myself and with others? And so to answer this question, I've developed a very simple, or <laughs> I shouldn't say simple, but a framework to help us move from this intention into action. And so of course it starts as us as individuals. And I, I appreciate something that we heard, I heard Brian say is change the system, we must change ourselves. And so I believe that starts with an awareness of our identities, our heritage, our cultural background, where we come from. You know, increasingly in my work, I find that the word diversity has become kind of a shorthand uh, in terms of thinking about women, thinking about people of color. Um, but this limited understanding of diversity does not acknowledge the myriad of ways in which we are all unique. And so the first step as an individual would be to recognize that to recognize the way that we've been categorized and racialized as that condition of colonization, which we could also spend all day talking about. <laughs> so I can confidently say, this is something you'll be unlearning for the rest of your life. But as the self evolves, we can extend ourselves in more inclusive ways. And so a more inclusive way would be that active awareness of our personal values, right? So for me, I practice, I value compassion, I value curiosity, I value belonging. And so in that way, it helps me make decisions around how I wanna show up. It looks like being aware of our biases and locating those patterns where our behavior is incongruent to those values. So at this stage, the desire is to embody allyship in a way that we're willing to make mistakes we're willing to get a little messy so we can really practice what we preach. Which motivates us to define that equity piece. What does equity look like in our day to day? And moving into that risk taking, being uncomfortable and asking the questions that are oftentimes unpopular. You know, like when and where are you willing to rock the boat? In what ways do you directly acknowledge harm and the needs of underprivileged groups? And how are you sharing decision-making power or resources with people who have been socially and economically excluded? So all really important questions on this journey to build belonging. So maybe you're thinking, wait, Michaela, is this just for individuals? Or is there only a framework for, for me as a person? And then to that, I would say no. You know, the, the framework definitely extends to how we think about our interpersonal relationships and how we think about institutions. 
But that is yet another conversation for another time and perhaps a masterclass. So shameless plug to reach out to me if you're interested in something like that, some additional workshops. Um, but what I really want to know and what I, we're going to get into next is to think about you and moving into breakouts. Um, so I would like to invite you to just reflect on your personal practice as an individual when it comes to belonging and begin to identify what does equity look like in your day to day. So we're going to be putting y'all in breakout rooms for around six minutes, which we know is short but sweet, um, and then we'll come back together and transition into our second half of our time together. So the question of the prompt to hold on to is, what does equity look like in your day to day? Welcome back. That probably felt like too little time. <laughs> Hopefully y'all were able to build a wee bit of belonging together. Um, we'll have a bit of time at the end of uh, the hour to kind of surface some of what's coming up. So I invite you to, to sit with whatever is bubbling for you uh, for just a few more minutes. And feel free to take a note that if you want to capture or bring back to the group. We'd love to hear how it's going for y'all. Um, I want to shift a little bit. So Michaela was just talking about uh, the I, how belonging shows up for us. And in Building Belonging, capital B, the collaborative that Michaela and I are part of, we talk about I, we, and world. So recognize that these three um, domains of transformation are interdependent. And belonging, at least in English, uh, my understanding is in a lot of other languages, it's a relational construct, right? Uh, you belong to something with something. Um, including ourselves. So for me, the, the core inquiry animating building belonging is this question. Um, can we create an us without a them? And my very felt sense in my body is, yes, uh, we can do that. It's just never been done at the scale this moment requires. And by the way, in the face of the climate crisis, uh, for those of you who are still roasting in London or Western Europe, um, it has to include non-human beings as well. So that sense of belonging needs to be expansive. And in cultures that are built on systems of oppression, patriarchy, colonialism, white supremacy, um, we're taught to identify them and to create difference around that them. So this, this task is challenging because it requires some unlearning before we can even step into the, the thing we're trying to build together. Uh, a couple of thoughts I want to offer here. One is we know, I think, at some intellectual level that most of our identities are artificial. Right, like the three things you would look at if you see my two-dimensional face here is because oh, it's a white man. Maybe you hear my accent and these it's American. Um, all three of those categories are made up, right? Like there is no such thing as America. There's no such thing as whiteness, right? Uh, man is a sexual or gender construct. And so I think what's at stake in this question of belonging is actually how do we think about our identities? And if we're trying to transform big systems, systems like patriarchy or white supremacy, we actually have to imagine what it might look like, what our identities might look and feel like on the other side of that. So I don't know how many folks here are parents, but I struggle all the time with my kids when they make an observation about difference and say, well, is that person A, whatever? I'm like, well, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, how do we think about an identity that we can ascribe to that isn't defined in opposition to somebody else? So the task I think is, especially for those of us who are in social change space is, the way we're taught to run a campaign is to identify a villain, right? Who's the enemy? Who's the thing you want to change? Um, that might be a useful short-term tactic. Uh, Long-term, you're creating another, right? So eventually you're gonna have to undo the work you just did. And I, I think I wanna invite us to think about where in our work and in our lives do we other? Where do we sort of put someone else in a different place? And how does that, how does that feel? And what are we saying about the world we wanna create when we do that? Uh, more to say there, but we'll move on to the next slide. And I think what I want to say here, this is a, it's called the Three Horizons Framework. Um, 
Bill Sharp and some others came up with it. I don't want to dive too deep into it, but I do think it's a really useful heuristic for thinking about where we play and the kind of transformation we seek. So this group, the Wasan folks, are we're here because we believe in systems change and we think about networks. So very briefly, Horizon One um, is a status quo. It's not looking good, folks, gotta be honest. <laughs> so we all think we need some, some change. And Horizon Three is the future we long for. And the thing that feels important to name here um, is it's real, it's accessible, right? Horizon Three is not unicorns and rainbows. We created patriarchy, we can uncreate it, right? We can have a post-patriarchal future, um, but we can't get there if we don't actually have a sense of what we want. So the, the work I think is not just to critique the systems that are holding us back, but to really put as, as much, I would even argue more energy into what does the future we long for look like and feel like, right? If we think the nation state system is no longer fit for purpose, what's on the other side of that, right? How do we organize ourselves um, to be responsive to the crisis we face? So the answer to that is this inner, this horizon two, this bridge space. And I think what, what I want to point out here is, um, I'd say all of us are doing Horizon 2 work. We are all trying to move from this world that hurts to a world that is better. And the challenge is, if we don't have a coherent, tangible vision for where we're trying to go, we can't get there. Um, so what ends up happening in this sort of system capture piece, you see the slide, um, that's what happens, right? So we, we're like, oh, we're going to take on the climate crisis. We'll do this clean coal. But of course, clean coal ends up perpetuating the system, right? It keeps us locked in the very thing we're trying to transform. So what, what I'm sort of trying to do with building belonging, what we're trying to encourage folks who are in funding spaces and social change spaces to think about is really to locate yourself in that, that horizon two plus space, a space of transformation, which is, can you stand on the other side in the world you long for and look back at the world as it is and build bridges from that space? Um, because if you do that, you're more likely to have something that's actually transformational. One sort of silly example here, small example is, I do a lot of work in masculinity spaces, and there's a whole discourse, which is great. Um, so status quo is toxic masculinity. That's the system that I was born into and raised in. Uh, we recognize rightly that it's not a great system. Um, so now there's lots of talk about conscious masculinity or sacred masculinity or reimagining masculinity. In my own sense, um, in the future I long for is I don't think we actually have masculinity at all, right? I think it's a construct that only exists because we define femininity. I can't define it, right? I can't define what a masculine attribute is. Um, anything I would name, I would just as easily say it's a feminine attribute. So I wonder whether that discourse is actually moving us in the direction we need to go or not. And that's a question that I think we need to sit with as we're thinking about what transformation might actually look like. Uh, last slide here, and then we'll we'll jump into breakouts because I know we're kind of throwing a lot at you here. Um, we started by talking about how we are agents in the systems we're trying to change, and that's always, at least for me, was a very humbling realization when it finally landed. Um, I think metaphorically, I thought of transformation as a lever, right? Like I stand over here and move that thing over there, and it's the wrong metaphor, right? Because as soon as you take action in a system, right, we're part of that system. And so with no prejudice against the institutions I've worked in, um, my experience was, and I was very much in this space, um, I thought the change needed to happen over there, right? Like y'all need to change. And so my work is to help you change. And in fact, what this, this uh, little diagram is trying to suggest is that no matter where you start change, the rest has no choice but to respond. So those of you who have tried to go to therapy uh, with your partner or in your family, Right, as you change, the family dynamic has no choice but to change, right? Or as your partner changes, you have no choice but to change. And the same is true systemically. So the two pieces I wanna just call out around this concept of, when I say it's a fractal, um, one is this idea that I think there's a movement now towards saying that interchange matters, and that's great, I think we recognize that. But the point is that it's all interdependent. So all three are related. And the second is, and we'll get into this more in the, in the next 30 minutes, is we practice what we become, right? So everything we do every day, every moment, whether we're using a strong tone of voice with our kids or a kind tone of voice with our partners um, is practicing, right? And so we are either practicing in the world as it is, perpetual status quo, or we're practicing a more liberatory future. And so we talk about this in Building Belonging as a, a future dojo, right? None of us got the skills we need, right? 
I did not learn how to navigate conflict as a kid. I did not learn how to <laughs> share space as a white man. These are not things I was socialized into. And so trying to practice different ways of being requires intentionality and work. Uh, last two thoughts here. So most of you, I suspect, um, like those that I know anyway, are in organizational settings, right? And I think belonging is incompatible with coercion, right? Belonging is a world where there is no coercion. And yet our organizational structures are hierarchical. There's a boss. Most of you could be fired, presumably, right? Uh, that is an inherently coercive construct. So trying to build belonging inside an organization that has built into it a concept of coercion is part of our challenge. And I think there's two ways it shows up. One is structural, right? How are we organized? And one is relational, right? How do we relate to each other? So I want to invite us into a second breakout now, a bit of an inquiry around how to deepen in some of these questions. And two things. One, I'll offer one prompt, but I also invite you to discard the prompt and speak to whatever feels alive for you right now, um, whether it's based on these last couple comments or from what Michaela was sharing and what came up in your last group. And the invitation is to think about the system you're currently working to change, right? Whatever system you're in, I don't know exactly for you what that might be. And for me, uh, what has felt what gave me the courage to launch Building Belonging in the first place, especially given the identities I hold in America, um, is finding my own stake in it, that I was no longer fighting for someone else or to change a world, but actually like, I wanna to belong to, and I can't belong in the systems as they're constructed. And so when you think about the work that you're engaged in, the provocation here is, what do you get out of that, right? For you personally, right, you're, you're doing systems change, but so what? How does that make your life better? And your answer has to begin with I, right? It can't begin with the world would be a better place and I'll feel better. Um, but what is actually transforming for you if your work is successful? Yes. Um, that's a lot of talking at you. Uh, makes me feel uncomfortable to do that, but thanks for bearing with us. And uh, yeah, we're gonna drop back into breakouts here for maybe, maybe we could do eight minutes, Fabian, if that works a little more space, um, be gentle with each other. This is some, uh, yeah, I mean, belonging done right is real. Like you can feel it in your body. So I encourage you to, right now I'm feeling some up tension in my chest. I feel like I've been speaking too fast. So just if you need to take a moment and breathe, I'm talking to myself here and then we'll see you back in a little bit and have a chance for a little bit of uh, time together before we close. Thanks Mariana, good looking out. And speaking of which, we'll be visiting you in Portugal, where belonging is built. It's just really been tricky. To be continued. <laughs> well, welcome back, everybody. We hope you had some really nourishing conversations in your small groups. We're in the kind of plenary Q and A portion of our time together, and just wanting to see what is alive for us. Um, but and so before we invite more voices in the room, I want to just you know kind of set our kind of container around ground rules and invite voices into the room um, that perhaps, you know, maybe if you're a person that tends to, you know, observe and notice, perhaps inviting you to take up some space um, in our in our virtual time together. Um, and if you're on the other, other end of that spectrum, maybe you're that person who speaks first and speaks often, can we just allow some spaciousness for the people who are more tender to take up some space? Um, and we're also, I think one of the questions that Brian was curious, and I, I'm also find myself being curious about maybe as a place for us to start is thinking about, you know, how does this concept of belonging, some of the things that we've talked about around systems change, you know, how do they land if in different countries uh, and in, in different languages, um, if there's something coming up for us there as a place to start.
I see a raised hand from Roya, and please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Yeah, no, you got it. Um, so something that's really standing out for me is the piece around imagining our identities on the other side of kind of those current constructs. Um, so I think something I practice and think about a lot is kind of systems on the other side, like futures on the other side. But I don't know that I've ever spent too much time thinking about what my identity could look like on the other side. Um, so yeah, that's something that's sticking with me. And I think that's gonna, I'm gonna do some exploring with things. Um, related to what Roya just said, I, yeah, I think I just have a very quick story that I love and that I've read um, that does that imagining um, from the other side. It's called Evidence by Alexis Pauline Gums. And um, it's sort of like a future version of herself um, writing back to this present version of herself. And uh, I don't know, it's a story that really stuck with me and uh, it came to mind as we were sort of talking about how do you yeah, how do you do that imagining? So I'll, I'll share a link to kind of a sketchy PDF version in the <laughs> chat. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thank you for bringing your voices into the room. Also love seeing people's thoughts in the chat as well, if that feels more comfortable or fluid for you. I think another area where I'm curious is, yeah, what has felt what has been maybe a very potent idea that you've heard in, in the breakout rooms in either in either of the small groups that we had? You know, is there something that you're really chewing on, an idea, uh, an expression that you've heard um, from one of your peers? Diane, I see your raised hand. And you're on mute. It, it struck me great, great conversation so far in both breakouts. Just one thing that struck me in our most recent breakout was a sense of kind of lived experience and the of otherness uh, driving that um, kind of being that driver for transformation. And you may be a curious, abstract curiosity right now with regards to what it takes for all of us to drive for inclusion, even when we are more privileged on whatever dimension it is and, and belonging, you know, how do we connect and uh, create space? It, it's, uh, it hasn't, it's not fully formed, but it's a question around um, how do we all take responsibility for belonging for multiple dimensions, especially those to which we, um, for which we have, um, you know, relative power. Thank you for that. I, I feel like there were so many rich things in what you shared, but I, the experience of otherness driving transformation is what I really heard. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to pass it to Rachel. Um, to build off Doyen's um, comment, one of the things that came up during our second breakout session was this idea of, of leveraging um, maybe our more privileged identities, because we are all intersectional identities. We have a million different versions of identity, but leveraging those more privileged identities as a means to push groups that might be more isolated or insular to, to push them to broaden their concepts of belonging. Um, so my, my, I am a white woman, the group I was talking with, we were all white women. So the idea of, of leveraging our whiteness to, to work within space, I definitely interact in spaces where the majority of people in the room are white men. And how can I be asking the right questions so that that group doesn't think that like, oh, you all think this is a good idea. It must be a great idea for everybody. Let's move it forward. Um, how like I have 
the privilege to be able to be in that room, how can I use that privilege to, to really leverage it and ask the right questions of like, are we really being inclusive? Like, is this idea good for this community, this community that you think it is for, but is anybody in that community here? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, um, it's, it's this idea of, of leveraging our privilege so that we can really um, expand the sense of belonging in different communities that we might have access to that other other people do not have access to. Thank you for that, Rachel. I saw lots of head nods um, in your share. And I think a question that was that was kind of coming up for me in relationship to what you're sharing around leveraging privilege was asked was considering like what is the unpopular question? Like what is that question that is risky in relationship to your equity practice? Um, so just food for thought in terms of what what might you step what might you take away or think about like what is that risky what for that risky question? Um, so I want to pass it to Wanda and then we'll move into the soft close. Sorry, Brian, I just saw your message. No, oh, good. Yeah, maybe um, Wanda can we'll invite you into the room and then we'll do a soft close. Folks have to drop. I see a couple of people in chat and then uh, Let's, we can we can do that because I'm going to have to I'm going to have to jump off as well. The only thing I wanted to just add 30 seconds was this concept of privilege. I grew up on a tiny reservation in upstate New York with no indoor plumbing and an electricity year that I was born. So what's the concept of what you think of that scenario? The reality is, is that I grew up extremely privileged. I actually kind of feel sorry that you guys didn't have the thousands of years of experience and, con and connecting to land that I did. I grew up in incredible brilliance and, and ingenuity. Um, and so recognizing that I have privilege that you don't have, um, that you'll never have. And it makes me you know, um, that's that's the part where I'd love to, I'd love for each other to truly see the brilliance in one another. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Well, I was going to say that all the juicy stuff is going to happen in the next 30 minutes, but now that Wanda's just kind of dropped that little <laughs> mic. <laughs> um, yeah, an invitation for folks who need to drop uh, to please do so. And what we're going to try to do in the next 30 minutes is have a bit more space here and invite folks to really ground into practice. So it's all well and good. We have this nice chat together. Hopefully it feels warm in your body. Uh, but so what if we don't actually do anything differently? And so we'll keep the space open for a few more minutes just for, for conversation. We didn't want to cut it off here, but what we're going to try to slow gently ease into is, um, yeah, Adrian Marie Brown talks a lot about we become what we practice, right? So what are the things, what's one thing really that we want to practice differently as a consequence of what's coming up in this conversation today. So just to let you know, that's where we're gonna be going uh, for folks who choose to stay and we hope you do. Um, but in this moment, a lovely farewell and whatever language uh, you speak to folks need to drop. Um, so yeah, the floor remains open. We'll do another few minutes of just kind of surfacing what came out of these conversations or what's still alive for you. Um, invite folks who uh, want to pick up Michaela's provocation here around what is the uncomfortable question. I really loved Wanda challenging our conception of privilege. That's a nice kind of play on, on where Rachel was going. And the one other thing maybe I'll drop in here is um, <clears throat> So the observation that led me to building belonging was around gender. Um, I noticed that in the conversations in the spaces I moved in, it was overwhelmingly female as we are here today. And that there's something around the language of belonging that <clears throat> women are able to name for themselves and show up sort of unapologetically. But men, um, I do a lot of work in men's spaces, um, have to back into it. Like you talk about belonging, they kind of you know, get a little squirmy. Um, and yet, the movements that are kind of breaking in the world right now, the authoritarianism, the rise of authoritarianism globally is an overwhelmingly male phenomenon everywhere in the world, right? Modi's India, Orban's Hungary, Erdogan's Turkey, right? Bolsonaro's Brazil. And the resistance movements are overwhelmingly female. And so there's something happening here around gender that feels important to name and to, to sort of step into. And part of my 
recognition and struggle, and this is a live inquiry for me, is that my demographic, so white men in America, 40, give or take five years, are the biggest flip-flopping vote in the country, right? Like a bunch of us voted for Bernie and then for Trump. So there's people who are all hanging on a knife edge around this question of belonging. And I think for people who have some of the privileges that I've been afforded in my life, um, we have a tendency to look out, right? Like how can I use my privilege to help others, which is great. Um, but there's a longing and a hunger, I'll speak for myself because I can be authentic about that, that I feel like I want to belong to. And there's a particular form of gaslighting in society that says, hey, you belong, this world was built for you. But the condition of that belonging is you can never actually be truly together because you're set above or in hierarchy in a domination relationship to others. Um, and that sucks. And so trying to find language for that to move towards a more authentic way of relating is my suspicion is what a lot of us men are feeling and longing for. We don't have language for it because the way patriarchy hits us is we don't know how to express our emotions, right? We don't know how to ask for help, right? And so I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know, Bobby and what the overall demographics of this group are. It's a little disheartening that so few men showed up today. Because I do think this is a space that um, guys are hungry for, even if we don't necessarily know how to name it. Anyway, I just want to throw that out there. But sorry, the space is back open now that I'm a white man taking up space again. Um, Brian, that brought up something for me that I don't, I'm really like kind of in the midst of grappling with. Um, but I, I come from a more traditional like social change spaces. Um, you know, probably more hierarchical, more, um, I don't know. And, and in some cases, like I'm in education, like you look back at like roots of my own work, there's a little bit more of like a savior complex, like people with privilege helping the underprivileged. And so I've, you know, done work on that. But a few years ago, I, I participated in a new, like a very different kind of social movement um, where I was just more of a participant. It wasn't my job. And it was very much in like kind of a more like community organizing model. And there was such a deep belief in like self-interest as, you know, like for anyone engaged, like connecting to your self-interest, like what actually serves you by doing this work, not just helping others. And it was really interesting to experience these like kind of two approaches to doing work for, for a better future. And um, I don't know, these questions that we're talking about now are the push about like, whatever work we do, how does that help? me as an individual feel more belonging it's like situating yourself in the system versus like um and so i really i really felt that in working in those two different spaces and um i don't know i'm just like kind of in the midst of um i don't know those those big traditional models of like social change are are um are big <laughs> And so I don't know what to do with that. I'm just resonating on like some of those ideas and like the differences I felt in those different orientations. And I guess the thing is about like the self-interest, there felt something more like authentic in the relationships potentially with, with people, like more like I'm fully here as a full human versus just a part of myself is here. Maybe to build on that, if I could, um, Sarah, is that, it's, it's similar, but maybe I was thinking of different words of how my my roles have been nonprofit charity, where there's a lot of white saviorism and almost a martyrdom that comes with it. And so when you asked the question earlier about, like, you know, how would it change your belonging? I went to, well, I don't want to situate I in this. Um, and yet, in order for us to do this work, we have to do the inner work. So that's what you've reminded me of is it's almost it, you're perpetuating that if you think I, you know, I can't do the I piece. Um, and I think that it's important to, as you said, Sarah, put ourselves in the system and do that deep, hard work, because sometimes it's easier to always shift to, well, I'm trying to shift organizations or systems, not recognizing that those that great diagram that you shared of how it's all interconnected. So I will continue to think about that. So thank you. Thanks, 
I see you raised hand, Anya. Um, so I worked in direct services for the first uh, 15 years of my career, and then the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been working in collective impact spaces. And one of the things I really love about this idea of population level results, which is really at the kind of like what I see the core of, of collective impact, um, this idea that we collectively can be responsible for and can achieve results for everyone. One of the things that I've come to love about it is how it helps me think about what would it mean to get to a result and a result like belonging for everyone? Well, it means I'm realizing these last couple of years that you have to think about the question of what would it look like for me? What would it look like for people um, who have been, who hold other kinds of identities? What, and, and what would it look like uniquely for people who have different kinds of identities? Because we can't get to, to everyone if we don't think about ourselves and we don't think about everyone else around us. So there's something really, I didn't, see it at first, um, but but again, these last couple of years, it's, it's been a really helpful frame, um, the, the frame of population accountability for me to think about the me, the all of us, and, and the different groups of amazing humans um, among the all of us. Thanks. Thank you. I think one thing I'll step in and say, I feel like I'm noticing that you know, that, yeah, the perception of self and other is so essential um, and that inner being that, that there is no separation between self and other. Um, it seems like that's kind of percolating below the surface of a lot of these comments. Um, so that's all for me. I'm gonna jump in here. Um, I always thought that belonging was a choice, mm -hmm. that you choose to belong or you choose not to belong. Until I moved to my community, and it took me 15 years to feel like I belong. I had to work hard at it. And I realized it's not a choice. Well, it, the choice is a piece of it, um, that there are other things at play that can help deepen belonging in a community, such as how we build our communities, right? Such as um, how we involve community in our programming. Um, and our systems and our strategies, such as how we um, show up in our space. So when you walk into a room, are you, are you arms crossed, head down? Um, you know, is that space conducive to you opening up? And so, and this, this is an amazing dialogue and conversation and, you know, I, I how, what, what is next? Like, how can we, as people who get belonging, I finally feel like I do belong in my community, just saying, um, how can I, how can, and I'm using the word I, because I had to go through it to understand it. Um, how can we, how can we create the supportive environment so that this is easier for people? Um, and that the, it, it maybe it's less of a choice it is just the way of and so I'm really curious about that um in this work thank you what a beautiful invitation and perhaps a transition um into our last breakout um <clears throat> yeah this is feeling like a really warm space so I, I almost don't want to to break us out but I also um want to give folks a little bit of space to reflect in a slightly smaller setting um, maybe just to take up Heather's invitation, and I think um, one, I'm really interested in like what it takes for people to take that step. You know, why did you do what you did? Why did you work 15 years and not give up, right? And a friend of mine, right before I, um, when I was thinking about trying to do building belonging, she said, you know, create the spaces you wish existed. And it's like, well, sounds kind of daunting. <laughs> do I have to? <laughs> Uh, so I think what we'd like to do is um, we'll do maybe groups of three again and maybe eight or nine minutes together. And the invitation to reflection here is uh, what do you want to do differently um, starting, you know, in 20 minutes? Um, Shimana's trying to duck out of here, but I see you, Shimana. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so we, we talk about this as a, a plus one, right? So <clears throat> you're on a track and you want to just shift that track a little bit. Um, what's one thing you want to take back and do differently? Um, Heather framed it as a, as a big question. It could be structural, and that's fine if that's the direction you want to go. 
my own sense is we all feel a little bit more comfortable at one level, I, we, or world. So whatever level you play at or want to play at, go ahead and, and play there. Um, yeah, I invite you just to, to, with each other, see if you can frame one intention about something you want to practice coming out of the space today. And then we'll come back here and have a lovely generative virtual close. Well, welcome back, everyone. It's so nice to see some smiling faces and hear that there are some juicy conversations happening in those small groups. Um, yeah, did, did, did we solve belonging? Do we have answers? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Um, so we are in our final moments together. And so I just want to give us a soft place to land as we transition out of this space. Um, and I guess I, I might ask you to think about what is your self-care plan if this session stirred up some feelings and emotions for you? Um, could it be taking a walk? Could it be, you know, getting a glass of tea? Um, how can you, you know, be sure to take good care of yourself after today? Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Brian to close us out. Yeah. Am I on the hook here? Um, yeah, I guess before we do that, maybe just invite um, any last voices that folks want to uh, presence here. Anything that came up that's alive for you. Maybe we can take one or two before we close. I won't name names, but at least one person was in the middle of a conversation and got bounced accidentally. I don't know if she wants to bring anything back. No pressure. I was just um, sharing with the last group that I was with. And by the way, I loved everyone I met in all of these breakout groups. It was really fantastic. Um, so thank you for um, in creating that space. But I was really struck by what you, were, you mentioned really quickly, Brian, and something that I've taken away is the relationship between power and belonging. I had never really thought about the idea of a coercive space. And I was like speaking with Lily and Doyen. It's just like, if you do all of this work yourself, but what if the person above you doesn't do the work? And then like Lily was mentioning, we're still stuck in the system, but it's really about how do those that report to us reflect on us um, in some regards. And um, as Doyen was saying too, it's for the leadership to kind of change how they uh, structure the organization and to do better with it. But I just really I just hadn't thought of this as like at the end of the day, someone can fire you. So you really are limited in, in what can or cannot be done. And it's just something I'm gonna sit with, but I really appreciated looking at it as coercion and it kind of is <laughs> in a way, not intentional, but ultimately that's where power resides, right? But I found the whole session as usual. Fabian, thank you. <laughs> I was on meeting, fantastic. Thanks, Denise. Yeah, I felt bad right after I said that. I was like, oh, did I just scare everyone? They're all going to quit their organizations. <laughs> uh, but no, I appreciate the inquiry. Maybe one more voice if anyone else feels called to share. Ah, deep breath, <clears throat> whatever you're feeling. Mm. Um, I want to thank Michaela. She's awesome. I love working with her. She makes me a better person. So thank you for your collaboration. Um, always a treat. And thank you for hosting this lovely space, as always. Um, he invited me to this last year. I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I can't. And I was like, you know what? This, yes, this feels right. And if Michaela is with me, then I'll feel, feel courage. So thank you all for um, helping shape the space. Um, we'll invite you to check out in the chat here in a moment, but um, two thoughts. One, just building on what Denise was just sharing. Um, one of the things we do in building belonging is try to create spaces for folks, both you know, in a relational context, deepen into some of this work. And then we also try to bring folks together who are holding these questions um, to share out. And so we'll have two opportunities to do that coming up. Um, I'll drop some links in the chat here, but one to Denise's question is we're having a, a conversation on liberatory governance which is how do we organize ourselves structurally and relationally towards belonging, right? Um, I can assure you that uh, I've never experienced that 
in my life. I, I feel suspect few of us have. We really try inside building belonging, um, but it's incredibly hard for all the reasons. So this will be a conversation with some of the, in my view, some of the best in the business. We're really sitting with these inquiries. Um, so that'll be happening on September 13th. Uh, we also have a conversation next week um, inside Building Belonging that will be, um, there's a Zoom session for a conversation with Monica Guzman, who's one of our members who just wrote a book on bridging divides and curiosity across difference. And it's um, rich. Uh, I have the joyful responsibility of being an interviewer, so I hope you all will ask better questions than I do if folks feel like joining. Um, we do our best in the you know, five minutes of model in this to share out what we're learning. So I do that. I have a personal newsletter where I kind of share whatever I'm struggling with, usually very inarticulately. We also have a Medium page where we try to share out questions that we're struggling with. Um, so you can follow us on um, Medium or YouTube for where these conversations are taking place. I'll drop these um, links in the chat in just a second. Um, I hope Michaela will share in the chat where you can find her. She does amazing work. Um, those of you who hopefully have had some sort of DEI experience in an organization at this point know how um, all over the map that space is. Um, sometimes you can have very good people, other times very harmful people. Um, everyone's doing their best, obviously, but like there's a way to hold this conversation that is loving and nurturing and helps you know, people of color step into their power, helps white people get over their shame. Um, Michaela is awesome at that. And it's a, it's a real skill. So I hope those of you who are seeking that need in your organizations can, um, can consider her a resource. Let me um, pass to Michaela and then maybe we can give the last word to close the space. Thank you for that, Brian. And um, I mean, I feel like I almost couldn't have said it better myself in terms of the offering that I um, feel called to, to bring to the world. Um, but I definitely feel passionate about safe spaces for these types of like courageous and intimate conversations. Um, so if that resonates with you um, and the work that you do in organizations, I would love to keep keep the connection and foster that. Um, and so, yeah, the link to my organization is in the chat. Um, and so all good things. Um, and I'll pass it to Fabian to close us out. I don't have anything to, to add besides saying thank you again. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Michaela and Brian. And thank you everyone for being here. That was really a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful opportunity to be together and learn together. Yeah. Um, and we'll share the recording with, if you are on our Google group, you will receive the recording and the notes and, and any follow-up links, the, the two facilitators will share with me. If you're not on the Google group, maybe email me <laughs> or um, message me um, if you'd like to get the future invites. That's it. Yeah. I invite folks to check out in the chat if you feel so called with a somatic feeling in your body, below your neck, uh, how, are, how are you feeling in your body? What's going on for you? Um, and also invite folks to come off mute and say goodbye in whatever way it feels good to you. But it's really good to see y'all. Thanks for coming. Yes, nice seeing you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.